as uh, potentially some other news too. I'll bring in my colleagues, the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellas, and the CBC's David Cochran quickly because I know that <laughs> he's going to uh, jump out there for, to come down his stairs very quickly. So uh, Vashi, we are expecting, I think, to hear a little bit more about Serb. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said that there would be an extension and that they were working on that. Yeah, get lots of political back and forth given that there's a confidence vote tomorrow in the House of Commons. We anticipate there will be more details. I'm being told by a number of people in the government it'll look like an extension through the rest of the summer, uh, at least till the end of August. I don't know, again, though, what added attestation they might put on or added conditions to accessing CERB, if that will be the case. So we'll look to find that out. And then the other thing I'm anticipating is, as our colleague uh, Katie Simpson first reported last week, that there will be another extension uh, of the restrictions at the border between the United States and Canada. No surprise given what we've been talking about, you and I, Rosie, mm -hmm. for a number of days, uh, the spike in cases in so many states. And uh, David, I, I guess they've, they, this, they, they've been working, obviously, on the border extension. There doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be any uh, pushback from the White House at this stage. It all seems to be rolling along pretty well. No, and they're rolling over the border because nobody's ready to open it, and they're rolling yeah. over the CERB because nobody's ready to come off it, or at least millions aren't ready to come yeah. off it. And on the attestation point, uh, there will be an update to that to say that you are actively looking for work. Uh, this is one of the things they tried to put in legislation last week when mm -hmm. things sort of fell apart and they couldn't advance any of their legislative agenda because of a lack of consensus with the opposition parties. Uh, so they will tweak the wording of the attestation for you to say that you are seeking employment. Um, because one of the downsides or the, of, of the CERB is that giving people $2,000 a month uh, particularly at the lower ends of the wage scale in the service sector and places like that. It, it, it is viewed by many employers as a disincentive to go back to work. So they want to sort of make it a little bit more like employment insurance, at least in philosophically, where you know you have to actively say when you get EI that you are looking for work and going right. out and trying to find a job. They're going to do a similar measure with uh, what you sign to qualify for the $2,000 a month you get with the CERB. Okay, and tomorrow is a is a confidence uh, vote in the House because it has to do with money, and that's uh, how confidence motions mm -hmm. are, are are generally built. It's estimates, so the the the, the approval for the money to that the government is is spending through all these measures. Uh, so we know that there's a lot of negotiations happening, as as Vashi mentioned, behind the scenes. Um, let's just get your both of your takes on on where the support will be at this stage. I, I think it's fair to say uh, no one wants an election. I don't think we're trying to set up that kind of. <laughs> drama um, but certainly it, it, you know these things are always possible what what the government has to do of course is is come up with someone to to dance with on this issue and that's why the CERB has been perhaps a little more complicated because it is while not it is not attached to the estimates it is it is part of what they are negotiating around that uh, Vashi so w where do we think that dance partner will come from at this stage? well it looks like likely the NDP I mean that the NDP has been the party and its leader Jagmeet Singh pushing the issue of the CERB extension last week they were very specific they wanted to see a four-month extension <coughs> Yesterday, Jagmeet Singh walked that back bit and just said, I want a commitment from the federal government that they'll extend it in order to help people who run out, who come up right. against the end of, of their eligibility, which happens in, in just a few weeks. And there's about 2 million Canadians in that position. So it's a lot of people, uh, as David underscored. So uh, now it depends who you're talking to. Is it the government? They're saying they were going to do this anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, the NDP is saying the government wouldn't have done it without the NDP pushing them to do it. The big question, as you rightly point out, Rosie, is whether or not what the government lays out today is enough to to get the NDP to support it in those votes on the estimates tomorrow. Uh, and, and we'll find out, I'm guessing, shortly. But my yeah. guess, if I had to wager, is probably yes. Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's, it is true. The government has long signaled it was not going to just cut people off from, from CERB, that they were looking for some sort mm -hmm. of other solution. What the NDP may have succeeded in doing, uh, David, is sort of putting some, lighting a bit of a fire under the government here. Um, but I would also point out the NDP uh, financially is in no position to go into an election either. So, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it is a bit of a game of chicken. I mean, it, it, important policy decisions, but it's also a bit of a political game of chicken here. Yeah, the, those conservative leadership debates this week would be kind of pointless if they uh, brought the House <laughs> down tomorrow and Andrew Scheer was, was running as conservative leader goes, in a staff yeah. election. <laughs> I, don't think, I, I think what the NDP probably accomplished and all of the opposition parties, uh, the conservatives, though, maybe not on board with this, was getting 
getting the penalties out of uh, CERB. Sure. Uh, the crackdown on fraud, the repayment, the up to a year in jail or whatever it is, and five thousand dollar fines, and the repayment of triple the amount of any money you got fraudulently. Um, you may see legislation come next week to deal with the disability payments that they wanted to do, and maybe some criteria changes to serve. I don't know uh, on terms of expanding who qualifies for it and that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. But a straight rollover, a uh, straight extension, is something the government can do without anybody's support. Right. And uh, by keeping that economic, because it's going to do it through regulation, uh, but so keeping that economic floor under millions of Canadians uh, probably gets them through tomorrow. But look. There's a lot of like, you know, Rams and those nature documentaries butting heads in public for sheer spectacle in Ottawa whenever we come up to a confidence vote. Uh, nobody's going to force an election in the middle of a pandemic. If they did, I think voters will probably rightfully punish them and they would deserve to be punished for it because never mind the health risks and all of the other things, the inconvenience and the inability of a government to properly respond to all the ebbs and flows of this thing. It's just a downright crazy idea at this point yeah, in time, yeah. given the state of the world, right? Yeah, it, it does, though. Uh, I mean, this is what a minority government does. It forces a government mm -hmm. to have to negotiate with different people and to compromise or, or move its position or uh, be a little more flexible in its position. And so, um, and it's worked so far the last yeah, couple of weeks. Yeah, it has worked. And, and they have managed to take suggestions from conservatives, from the NDP. I'm not sure if they've taken anything from the bloc, but they, they, they tend to talk through these things and, and they get to a place where they uh, get agreement. So we would imagine that will happen as well for tomorrow. I should say the Prime Minister also has, I don't know how many phone calls today with world leaders around the UN Security Council vote, which is taking place tomorrow. Don't know if he'll refer to that here, but here now, the Prime Minister of Canada. Over the past few months, we've introduced programs that are making a real difference in the lives of millions of people right across the country. Take the Rose and Crown pub in Canmore, Alberta. As they were getting ready to welcome customers again, they used the wage subsidy to rehire 15 employees. And they got a loan through the Canada Emergency Business Account so they could buy personal protective equipment, plexiglass screens, and additional hand washing stations to comply with public health guidelines. That's good news for people who are now back on the job and for locals who missed their favorite neighborhood spot. When this crisis first began, a lot of people lost their jobs overnight. They didn't know how they were going to feed their families or pay their bills. So our government responded rapidly and substantially to support Canadians with programs like the Canada Emergency Response Benefit and the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. Three months later, we're beginning to see across the country that we're now in a place where we're gradually and safely starting to reopen parts of the economy. But I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We still have a long journey ahead. Some sectors will bounce back more quickly than others. Many workers will be able to find work, but others won't. Over the past few months, Canadians have been able to count on the Canada Emergency Response Benefit to help them get through a tough time. And the reality is that even as we start to reopen, a lot of people still need this support to pay their bills while they look for work. That's why today, I am announcing that we will be extending eligibility for the CERB by eight weeks. So if you've been getting the CERB and you still can't work because you're unable to find a job or it's just not possible, you will keep getting that $2,000 a month. Over the next few weeks, our government will look at international best practices and monitor the, monitor the economy and the progression of the virus to see what changes, if any, need to be made to the program so that more people are properly supported. But I want to be very clear with Canadians. Our goal here is to make sure that the CERB is working for you in the best way possible. Our government will continue to be there for you. This pandemic is an unprecedented challenge for our country. And we're going to make sure that all of our supports, including the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy and Employment Insurance, are working effectively to get Canadians back on their feet. That's also a big part of the reason why I proposed to give the provinces and territories $14 billion to make sure that you have childcare, that there's testing and tracing, and that your workplace is safe. As the situation evolves, so too must our response evolve with it. And that's what we're going to keep doing. Dès le début de la crise, 
Since this crisis began, our government uh, began working quickly to support Canadians with programs such as the emergency response benefit and the emergency wage subsidy. Three months later, we're now in a position to start to gradually and cautiously reopen the economy, partly because businesses are using programs like the emergency wage subsidy. But I want to be absolutely honest with you. We still have a long way to go in the coming months. Some sectors will rebound more quickly than others, and many people will find work, but not everyone will. In recent months, Canadians were able to rely on the emergency response benefit to get through these tough times. But the reality is that even if some activities are starting up again, a lot of people still need that support to pay their bills as they seek work. That's why today I am announcing that we will be extending eligibility for the emergency response benefit by an additional week, eight weeks. That means that if you're receiving the CERB and you cannot return to work because you can't find any work or simply because it just isn't possible right now, you will continue to receive your $2,000 a month. In the coming weeks, our government will be looking at international best practices as well as monitoring the economy and the progression of the virus to determine whether we need to make other changes to the program to provide more support to people. But I want to be perfectly clear with Canadians. Our goal is to ensure that the CERB works for you. Our government will continue to be there for you. The pandemic represents an unprecedented challenge for our country, and we want to ensure that all supports, including the emergency wage subsidy and employment insurance, are there to help Canadians get back on their feet. We want to give you the support that you deserve during this turbulent time, and in fact, that's one of the reasons why I proposed to give the provinces and territories some $14 billion so that you have the child care service services that you need so that we can increase uh, testing and contact tracing and so that you can return to work safely. The situation continues to evolve and our response must also evolve and that's what our government will continue to do. I want to close this morning with some news regarding the Canada-US border. I can now confirm that Canada and the United States have once again agreed to extend by 30 days until July 21st the current measures in place along our border. This is an important decision that will keep people in both of our countries safe. I just want to close today with the news that the Canada-U.S. border will, uh, that Canada and the United States have agreed to extend by 30 days until July 21st the measures currently in place at the border. This is a decision that will protect people on both sides of the border as we continue to fight COVID-19. On that note, I'm now ready to take your questions. Thank you, Prime Minister. <coughs> we'll now go to the phone for questions. One question, one follow-up. Operator. Thank you. Merci. For questions, please press star one. For the question, étoile un. First question, Christy Kirkup, The Globe and Mail, line open. Good morning, Prime Minister. Many legal experts say that one concrete thing that your government could do to reduce the harms caused to Black and Indigenous communities would be to remove all mandatory minimum sentences in the criminal code. Will your government make this commitment? That is certainly one of the clear recommendations that is coming out. Uh, there are, uh, uh, there's a clear uh, message today from the Parliamentary Black Caucus uh, to that effect, and we're going to continue to look at that and other measures that we can move forward to make sure that our justice system does not continue to be unfair towards uh, racialized Canadians and Indigenous Canadians. Yes. Removing mandatory minimum sentences is certainly one way of moving forward, and we are currently looking at that and other measures to ensure that our justice system is fair to all racialized and indigenous Canadians. And Prime Minister, Mexico has halted sending upwards of 5,000 additional workers to Canada until it has assurances that there will be uh, closer monitoring of health and safety rules. 
and until there's a better grasp of what went so wrong, uh, what will you do to address their concerns? Uh, I spoke with uh, President uh, Lopez Obrador uh, just a couple of days ago. We uh, touched on this topic. I shared my uh, sympathies and condolences to the families of the uh, Mexican uh, workers who uh, passed away here in Canada. Uh, we are also, as a country, preoccupied with what has happened, uh, and we're. <clears throat> And we are going to make sure uh, that we're uh, following up, uh, not just with our partners around the world, but uh, with Canadians to ensure that we know what happened and we make sure that we're keeping all workers in Canada safe. Uh, I had an opportunity to speak to President Lopez Obrador a couple of days ago, and we talked specific, specifically about that. And I told him that we would be working very hard to ensure the safety of all workers, including temp temporary workers. Thank you. Merci. Prochaine question, Raymond Fillon, TVA. À vous. Thank you. Good morning, Prime Minister. Uh, with respect to the CERB, I understand there will be no additional restrictions, but last week you were talking about legislation to remove the CERB uh, from people who are able to work. Why this about face? Well, we had proposed a bill that was going to uh, allow for uh, a, a more consistent attestation that people were seeking work, but we decided to move forward forward with regulations or the recommendation that people continue to seek work. We want people to get back to work if there is work there for them. But we also know that there are three million people out there who want to work but cannot. The economy is slowly starting to reopen and many people would like to work but they simply will not be able to do so. So we will continue to be there for them while seeking other ways of encouraging people who can return to work to do so. We uh, knew that uh, moving forward uh, with our, our bill would uh, give us further measures to encourage people and to uh, you know, make sure that people were taking work when it came up. Uh, we're still looking at ways of moving forward to encourage people to uh, look for work and to uh, make sure that they are uh, taking jobs that become available. The reality is that there are three million people uh, out of work who are looking for work. Uh, and even as our economy is reopening, there are many, many more people out of work willing to work than there are jobs available. And that'll be the, the story for the coming weeks as well. So uh, we're going to keep encouraging people to take jobs when they do. And we've seen just with the job numbers that many, many people have been uh, returning to work uh, from all income ranges. But we know there's more to do and we will keep working on it. In Follow up. But what is there in this extension that would encourage people who can work to return to work? And how much will this new uh, extension cost? Well, we know that with the kind of unemployment we're seeing now, people who would like to work and cannot uh, work. Uh, because there simply are not enough jobs out there. The economic recovery is coming, but it won't be quick enough to ensure that everyone who wants to work can find a job. So we need to extend the CERB so that people who can't work because they can't find a job or because they're looking after loved ones being infected with COVID-19 uh, will have money to be able to pay their rent and groceries. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Alex Ballengal, Toronto Star. Line open. Morning, Prime Minister. Just returning to the, uh, the uh, statement from the Parliamentary Black Caucus, uh, have you had a chance to read through it? And uh, I, I see that it's, it's been signed by a number of uh, supporters, including some of your cabinet ministers. Should we take that as a signal that, that you're willing to move on, on this stuff, or, or will you commit to uh, fulfilling the list of demands that we see in that statement? I've, I've said many times we are committed to moving forward uh, on a huge range of measures. We're working with communities, we're working with uh, leaders like members of the uh, Parliamentary Black Caucus uh, to identify what exactly we need to move forward first in priority on. Uh, but uh, I think it's really important that we all come forward and look at bold ideas that we can take on uh, very soon to uh, fix the systemic discrimination that continues to exist in our country.
I think it's important to continue to be listening and to work with community and parliamentary leaders, including the Parliamentary Black Caucus, to ensure that we are uh, ambitious enough to finally put an end to systemic discrimination that exists right across our country and all our institutions. So as I said, we will be moving forward with concrete steps, and we are working with all our allies and partners to determine in what order and what exactly we'll do first. The, the Treasury Board website data published uh, on the website shows the RCMP spending has, has gone up by 32% uh, since, your, since uh, the year you took power, uh, which is about $900 million in spending. So I'm wondering if you can tell us why that budget has gone up so much. And uh, if you're you're looking at as as that statement you just discussed uh, calls for, looking at reallocating some of that spending to different programs, we are always. Uh, going to make sure that money invested in keeping Canadians safe is spent exactly the right way. Uh, we uh, took office at a time where uh, the previous government had made budgetary cuts to a range of law enforcement and security services, and therefore uh, we needed to make sure that there was an ability to continue to keep Canadians safe. But at the same time, I think uh, what we've seen over these past weeks uh, and what we've heard from, <clears throat> from black, racialized and Indigenous Canadians uh, very clearly, not just over the past weeks, but over years, means uh, that we do have to look at uh, budgets, we do have to look at allocation of funds, we do have to look at how we're making sure that community supports, community programs, grassroots organizations, uh, and uh, various support programs are also properly funded. Thank you. I think it's important to ensure that uh, uh, spending on the security and safety of Canadians is done properly. And we will be looking at budgets so that we are sure to invest in things that help Canadians. If we need more investments in some uh, frontline programs, for example, or community programs, or other initiatives uh, to move forward, then we will do whatever we need to do to provide that support. Thank you. Merci. Prochaine question, Emily Bergeron, Agence CUNY. À vous. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. We are announcing today that there will be an extension of, by eight weeks of the CERB rather than what happened previously. Is this something you can do by regulation? But last week, you tried a different process to modify the CERB. Why have you decided to wait to, for those negotiations that really didn't work out to finally signal that you will be extending the CERB? Well, within that bill, there was a, a more extensive attestation that would have been required that would have forced people to be actively seeking work. This is something we needed to do uh, based on that bill. Now, since that bill did not pass, we had to find some other way of encouraging people to seek employment. But it's important to remember the situation we find ourselves in now. There are millions of people out there who would like to get back to work but cannot because the jobs simply aren't there at this time. So those people who want to work but cannot work uh, don't have employment, well, you know, they need support. And that's why we will be extending the emergency response benefit for an additional eight weeks. Follow up? Yes, as a follow-up, Canadians who were waiting for this announcement and have been waiting for it for several weeks and didn't know exactly what was going to happen in July, I mean, they now know that you could have proceeded by regulation. So how do you explain the fact that this took so long? Well, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit was intended to go uh, ahead until July. And now uh, we are saying that it will not stop. It will be extended for an additional two months, which will reassure people 
de prendre des emplois and uh, encourage them to get a job if there are jobs uh, in their Bonjour, communities. Radio Canada, a question on Serb. It wasn't clear how much will the this cost. The first three months cost 43 billion. Can we make the same uh, calculation and assume that these this extension will cost two thirds of that? Is that the right calculation? Do you have an idea of the cost? Well, as always, we will be sharing with the finance committee detailed figures on this. But our hope is that as the economy reopens, fewer and fewer people will need the CERB. We have already seen people who were on the CERB in May leave that benefit in June. And that's a positive movement, and we hope to see that continue. There are a lot of businesses who are rehiring their workers uh, thanks to the wage subsidy, and we hope that that will cost less, but we'll be able to provide more detailed protection projections soon. So. Now, there are, on January 8, Flight 752 crashed. There are still many questions out there. Are the black boxes in France? And five months later, the families are still asking whether light will be shed on what happened. What do you say to those families today? We continue to work on this in spite of the pandemic, in spite of... Uh, of uh, we know about the terrible disaster that occurred with Flight 752. Minister, former Minister Ralph Goodale has been dealing with this issue. I told you I spoke to the President of Ukraine uh, a few days ago where we discussed that, and we continue to work together on it. The black boxes are supposed to be sent to France soon, but Iran is explaining that because of COVID-19, they cannot do it. We are continuing to pressure Iran Iran because we need answers. We know that we need uh, justice to be done for those families that lost their loved ones, and we continue to work on that. We know that there are still families reeling from the uh, terrible loss of uh, the uh, Iran air, uh, air takedown. Uh, we know uh, that there's a lot more work to do. Uh, the uh, black boxes uh, have uh, uh, been promised to be transferred to France, but Iran is saying that uh, they can't do it right now because of COVID. Uh, obviously, even though there's a pandemic, we're continuing to work uh, on this issue. I spoke with President Zelensky of Ukraine uh, just a couple of days ago where this issue uh, was discussed. We're going to continue to put pressure on the Iranian regime alongside our international partners uh, to get answers, to get justice, uh, to get compensation for the families. Uh, and this is something we've committed to do and we will continue to do. Uh, the Honourable Ralph Goodale uh, is uh, leading these efforts for Canada and continues to be closely engaged on it. Mia Rabson from the Canadian Press. Is your government willing to do what's needed to allow the Canadian cities to be part of the hub for the NHL to continue to play? And when will that decision be made? Um, uh, we have indicated that uh, we are uh, comfortable with moving forward on an NHL hub in uh, one of three Canadian cities that are asking for it. Obviously, the decision needs to be made uh, by the NHL and the, the uh, cities and provinces in, uh, in, in the jurisdiction, but uh, Canada is uh, open to it as long as it is okay by the local health authorities. Okay. Uh, I know that this is a decision that is going to be made by local and provincial authorities in the three cities who would like to have the NHL play this summer. But this is a decision that will be made by the NHL, and the federal government is open to that going forward. Parliamentary Caucus has a number of economic measures that they're specifically asking for help to uh, in the COVID-19 recovery for Black-owned businesses, as well as more work from the government in, to uh, include businesses owned by Black Canadians in procurement. Are you ready to commit to those things specifically going forward? Uh, many of these things uh, were things that we are already working on, along with uh, the Liberal Black Caucus. Uh, so uh, yes, we know that there are significant economic measures that have been brought to the fore by this pandemic that uh, were already existing challenges. 
challenges and the uh, success of uh, black owned businesses, black entrepreneurs and, uh, and uh, young black uh, professionals uh, has been something that I've had many discussions on over the past uh, couple of years with uh, members of the black community in Canada and we will be moving forward on a number of those recommendations. <clears throat> Cette pandémie we a know that this pandemic uh, has highlighted uh, the challenges, the economic face, challenges uh, Canadian, uh, noir, uh, facing uh, black Canadians. And we will continue to work with the community on economic measures, on investments and partnerships and programs to help uh, young entrepreneurs and youth to succeed. In my last roundtable with the black community in Toronto and Montreal over the last year, I have often heard the about the economic barriers that are a major problem. We are already working on programs and we will obviously expedite that process. Mr. Tom Perry, CBC. The vote on the UN Security Council seat is coming up. You've been speaking to your fellow leaders. You've been lobbying hard. I'm wondering just how you're feeling about Canada's chances going into this vote. I think, as I've said from the beginning, getting a seat on the UN Security Council for Canada is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. It's a way for Canada to continue to uh, be influential and have an impact in multilateralism and uh, around the world. Over the past number of months, whether it's been on COVID, whether it's been on uh, development and financial reform, whether it's been on climate change, whether it's been on a range of things from peacekeeping to security to uh, women, um, we have been moving forward and leading the way. Uh, we will continue to do that. What we've done over the past months, uh, yes, has been talking about the Security Council, but also looking for ways concretely where Canada can be more engaged on the world stage. And regardless of what happens in the campaign, uh, we are more engaged and we will continue to be more engaged on the world stage. Uh, as I've said uh, right from the very beginning, a seat on the UN Security Council is not an end in itself for Canada. It's a means of continuing to have a positive impact uh, on the world, projecting our values, supporting multilateralism at a time when mutual support and coordination between the countries of the world has become even more important. And Canada is leading, whether it's on COVID, whether it's on funding international institutions or developing countries, or countries uh, uh, in various regions, whether it's fighting climate change or working uh, on peacekeeping and other operations. The fact is that Canada is very engaged on the international stage, and that will continue. We do hope to secure that seat uh, in the elections held in the coming days. But whatever the result, Canada will continue to use all means of remaining involved and engaged and having a positive impact on the world. The pitch that, and just to follow up on the, um, our pitch for a seat at the United Nations Security Council, the pitch from a year ago seems to be somewhat different than we're making now. And I'm wondering if you can talk to us about how the pandemic has influenced and has changed what you're saying to members of the United Nations Security Council who can vote. I think one of the things that we've seen uh, through this pandemic is just how interconnected and interdependent the world is. Uh, you can take it in the positive and the negative. Obviously, the interconnections have left us more vulnerable to economic shocks and uh, more vulnerable to spreads of virus. But at the same time, that resilience that we're able to do by leaning on each other, the uh, multiple supply chains that we can create, uh, the establishment of common rules and approaches around things like trade, around things like uh, health, health approaches, around coordinating international travel is more important than ever. Now is a time for us to reflect on our multilateral institutions and how they can be improved given this crisis uh, in the 21st century. Many of our multilateral institutions were created uh, 70, 75 years ago following the tremendous shock and upheaval of World War II. And those institutions have served us well as a world over the past many decades. But this crisis is an opportunity for us to rethink them and to think about what is truly needed to make sure that we have a fairer, more just world, to make sure that the most vulnerable within our countries and around the world uh, are better supported, better protected, and given better opportunities. 
peace. And at this moment, the ability uh, for countries to convene together, to pull together different voices, uh, is more important than ever before. And Canada, uh, by dint of having uh, a seat at the G7 table, at the G20 table, at APEC, at the Commonwealth, at the Francophonie, the uh, Organization of American States, and many other uh, different multilateral tables, has always been able to pull people together and move forward concretely. And right now, as we look at the kind of world we're going to come out to come out of uh, post-COVID, we need a country like Canada that is big enough to make a difference, but small enough to know we can't do it alone, and we will continue to work together. Okay. I think that over the years, Canada has shown just how much we know it's important to work in a coordinated fashion around the world. But this crisis has highlighted the fact that that collaboration is now more important than ever. We are more interconnected, and therefore we must show resilience and creativity in the way we work together as we redefine international relations and multilateralism. Canada has shown an ability to be a strong voice for many organizations and many countries around the world because of our presence in the G7, the G20, the Commonwealth, the Francophonie, OPEC, and the Organization of American States. It's a way of bringing voices together and looking at the future with optimism and creativity to see what kind of world we want to build for the future. Canada is big enough to make a difference, but small enough to know that we can't do everything on our own. So this is a time when leadership on the part of countries like Canada will be extremely important on the world stage. You spoke earlier, sir, about temporary foreign workers from Mexico coming here and contacting COVID-19, and you said you were looking at measures to make it safer. I'm wondering what specifically are you going to do to make sure it is safer for temporary foreign workers to come here to Canada. I think uh, we know that there are many issues from uh, living conditions to uh, the fact that uh, they're tied individually to particular uh, companies or employers uh, to uh, various uh, various challenges around labor standards that uh, require uh, looking at. We can even look at things like pathways towards citizenship that could uh, give people more rights. Uh, we rely on uh, temporary foreign workers for a large part of our agricultural production in this Canada, in this country, uh, but uh, we should always uh, take advantage of uh, moments of crisis to reflect on, uh, can we change the system to do better, better for Canadians, but also better by the people who come here and make sure we stay fed. I think we need to reflect on how we can better protect temporary workers, whether it's their working conditions or their work permit. And at the same time, we know that in this crisis, we have a chance to think about how we can reimagine a system where we rely, rely on temporary foreign workers in order to ensure that our agricultural industry operates properly. Are there changes we can make? Yes, we're looking at that now. Oliver with CTV National News. For 16 months, Canadian Yasser Albaz has been arbitrarily detained in a crowded Egyptian prison, and recently he has developed severe COVID-like symptoms. Will you make a personal appeal to President Sisi to release him, and what challenges does your government face bringing somebody home who may have COVID? Uh, first of all, we have continued to uh, get uh, consular support and access. It is uh, something that this government takes very seriously, the health and safety of uh, Canadians detained abroad. And we will continue uh, to do everything we can to ensure that they are properly treated and uh, eventually, uh, if possible, brought home. At the same time, uh, the question of ensuring a safe return because of COVID is, uh, is always an issue, but we have uh, measures around quarantine, measures around uh, uh, safety, measure, uh, safety uh, protocols in place uh, that uh, means that that wouldn't be a barrier if, uh, if uh, this individual were to be able to return home. Merci beaucoup tout le monde.
Okay, that is the Prime Minister of Canada on this Tuesday morning, and I'll just say what everyone is thinking before we get into the meat of what he said. Yes, he did get a haircut. So uh, <laughs> I know many Canadians are, are rushing to do that after a few months without one. Uh, but let's talk more about the, the policy news that he had for us today, now that that uh, bit of lightness is out of the way. And it was, as we expected, uh, an extension of the CERB, Vashi. Yes, an extension uh, by two months, by eight weeks of the CERB. And just a reminder, as we've been discussing over the past few days, there are about uh, two million Canadians who come up against the end of the CERB. The Prime Minister used the number three million uh, for how many Canadians are out of work and looking for work. Uh, and so there weren't a lot of details necessarily about if anything changes. It really sounded to me like it was just a continuation mm -hmm. of the program mm -hmm. as it exists right now. Certainly, I'm sure, welcome news for uh, people who were coming up against the end of this program and, and still unable to find jobs. Of course, that varies depending where you live because the degree to which the economy is open is so different depending on where you live. Uh, I've been furiously trying to text a number of people to find out what the estimated cost of the program will be uh, for those two months. And so far, I don't have an answer. Uh, they are trying to, to figure that out. You heard the prime minister get that question a few times. He also didn't have a specific number for the cost of the program, but did say that it would depend on, I mean, their hope is more people move over, for sure. example, to the wage subsidy program, and there might not be the need uh, for the CERB that existed, let's say, in any of the two of the first four months, because so many people needed it, let's say, in Mar the, you know, from March 15th to April 15th and yeah. the following month, uh, it might not be as much, but we are talking, obviously, you know, upwards of, I think, uh, based on some of the numbers I've looked at, $20 billion at least, uh, probably a lot more if the need is as acute as it has been in some previous months. So I will continue to try and find out uh, what the cost of that is. But certainly that's a, a big chunk of change. Uh, the government is already looking at a $260 billion deficit, uh, but clearly the, their assessment, and, and based on a lot of political conversations as well, is that the need is still there. We know that from the numbers, as I mentioned, 2 million Canadians. Uh, I do want to just quickly touch on one other thing that stuck out for me, and mm -hmm. that was the questions around migrant workers. I think it's a it's a pretty important issue right now on a number of different levels. Uh, we've seen uh, the the ambassador from Mexico, the Mexican government, press pause on sending any additional temporary foreign workers as of last night, first reported by the Canadian press, because two men, 31 years old and 24 years old, in the Windsor area, two migrant workers, have been have passed away because of COVID-19. Uh, there is a group, the uh, Canadian, sorry, I want to make sure I have the exact right name, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Workers' Alliance for Change, the Migrant Workers' Alliance for Change, that did a survey they released last week. They talked to hundreds of these foreign workers who were very concerned about the conditions in which they were working and sort of the, the measures of isolation and if they do contract the virus. The city of Windsor also very concerned as well. The reason that Premier Ford kept them in uh, a more restrictive phase and didn't move them along with so many other areas of Ontario was because of the spread of the virus among the migrant worker communities. I know that the mayor of that city uh, wants to increase the amount of testing. There are concerns from those advocates that there's not even adequate inspections taking place. And of course, both the NDP and that group are really calling on the federal government to amp up efforts to, for example, introduce permanent residency for many of these migrant workers. Uh, it's a real live issue right now, and I think it's, it's, it's getting worse as we speak based on everything that we're hearing from those uh, who are involved in the situation. And clearly, that's what the Mexican government says as well. The prime minister got a number of questions and said uh, in essentially that it does force us to re-examine sort of the system that exists right now and how uh, this country deals with those workers and treats those workers. But he didn't have any specifics on, for example, whether or not they're looking at an accelerated uh, path to permanent residency or if they're going to change sure. the way in which uh, they do inspections. Uh, obviously, we're staying tuned for news on that. And, and Minister Marco Mendocino is, is sort of overseeing that file. But the concern is pretty acute from, as I mentioned, those advocates, the people in those, you know, who are working, the people who employ them, who also so put food on our table, uh, and, and as well, uh, the, the city of Windsor. Uh, and I think the two out of three cases in New Brunswick yesterday were also in my, among migrant workers, too. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for highlighting that uh, important story, certainly also because uh, Canada and, and much of our food sector is so reliant on those foreign temp the temporary foreign workers who come in and, and help at uh, planting season and uh, harvesting season. On the CERB, the CERB, the total amount spent so far is $43 billion. So it, just to give you a sense of what it cost over the past number of months and uh, for, some, for some international kind of context around what other countries are doing, for instance, in the United States, uh, the president has 
has said that he is not going to uh, go beyond the, the top up that they were giving to people towards the end of July. And they are going to move to some sort of get back to work incentive. I think they were getting 600 bucks uh, weekly as a, as a as a as a bonus as a benefit uh, around the uh, the pandemic but that that was going to get cut off so this gives Canadians we're going to talk to someone in a moment another uh, two months which which I imagine David will help a lot of people yeah Rosie it also just shows uh, we're three months into this basically it was around the middle of March when Parliament suspended and then the borders started to close and people were told to stay home and we're still a long way to go before we're out of it I mean we're rolling over two big things direct payments to Canadians who can't work to keep them uh, above water and and rolling over the border closure with the United States. So as we inch towards a return to normal with things starting to reopen, there's a constant reminder of just how abnormal still things are, right? And, and two other issues, uh, one quite significant and one kind of uh, entertainingly interesting. The sig quite significant one is, is are the demands from the Parliamentary Black Caucus on some immediate changes on things like justice reform, how police operate, getting rid of mandatory minimums. We did hear from the Prime Minister yesterday uh, saying that they were looking at a series of recommendations and getting ready to take immediate action on the things that they, they can move on quickly. And now this uh, written public demand from uh, MPs and senators from uh, all parties sort of demanding uh, these changes uh, that shows that you know while we deal with uh, the, the fallout uh, of the health crisis the country is in the the campaign for better racial justice and equality is continuing uh, and and apparently based on the indications we've seen from the Prime Minister being heard um, the other thing we heard from the Prime Minister today that sports fans are going to be keenly interested in is his willingness to allow this hub city plan to be one of the Canadian cities for, so that the NHL season can restart and the playoffs can get going uh, this is something that the NHL NHL has been trying to do is, you know, the, the return to sports happens. Uh, it is a way to get playoff hockey in Canada, which is something we haven't really had a lot of in the last little while. But the Prime Minister is signaling a willingness to work with the league and to work with provincial and local health authorities to have this hub city plan happen. There was initially some reluctance to do that. We've seen a softening of that in places like Edmonton and, and, and in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, this would be a, a significant economic thing potentially, but also just one of those pressure release valve things that if the NHL can find a way to do sports safely, uh, you may not be able to go in person, but a, a lot of people are going to want to watch that in the Canada as a distraction from uh, all the pretty ugly things from that everything are happening else. right now. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. right. Um, yeah, and just on, on the, the black parliamentary uh, group that, that sent in this um, long letter of suggestions to the government today, there was also attached a long list of uh, what they called allies in the letter, and mm -hmm. it included uh, liberal MPs and even cabinet ministers. And the prime minister did say, um, we are open to reviewing mandatory minimums, which interestingly was something that was in his uh, first justice minister's uh, mandate letter, Jody Wilson-Raybould. Uh, but there were other suggestions in there too: better race-based data, uh, supporting black businesses better, um, eliminating Culture and any, arts. yeah, lots of legal yeah. aid, um, putting more restorative justice in place. So lots of concrete um, things that certainly the government could pick up and, and move to get in place right away if it wanted to um, take some action on that very quickly. Uh, and I will just end on, if I can get just bo get but you both to weigh in on the, the United Nations, because I note that the Prime Minister is speaking with, or has spoken with today, the Prime Minister of Spain, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, the Prime Minister of India, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and Grenadines, and obviously this vote tomorrow, um, an important one for, him, for the government, and I would say, even though he said, you know, we'll do our work anyway, an important one for him personally too, Vashi. Yeah, he certainly, uh, I think, as, as the Prime Minister, has hitched a lot to it, and, and the government has as a whole, right? They, right from the outset, have uh, had begun campaigning. The ambassador, Canada's ambassador to the UN, Marc-Andre Blanchard, has as well. Uh, and interestingly, uh, obviously, things have changed. That process has changed very dramatically uh, throughout the pandemic. My understanding is they're hosting a Zoom reception tonight. I mean, part of this, uh, the campaign, <laughs> as it has existed in the past, is very much, you know, whining and dining receptions, a lot of, you know, quote unquote schmoozing, which is certainly what turns a lot of the critics of this campaign off. Uh, but but it is sort of a fact of, of the way these things operate. And the pandemic, as I said, has has really changed that. I think, uh, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see. We may not I should I should preface all of this by saying we may not know tomorrow the outcome for Canada because you have to win two thirds of the vote. There are two spots. We're competing against Ireland and Norway. So 
for example, if one country is way out ahead and, and they get two thirds of the vote, but the others don't, you have to go to a second round. So right. it is very possible that we might not know the outcome of that. Uh, I, I've been trying to, I'm sure you guys have to talk to as many people as possible to gauge whether or not they think they're they're going to win. Uh, they have been canvassing all the people that you listed off over a number of weeks. Actually, somebody told me this morning for the last two years, there has rarely been a conversation that the prime minister has had with a counterpart internationally that did not in which he did not bring up the UN. So th that gives you an idea of how near and dear to their, uh, you know, political hearts, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. this this campaign and, and securing this seat has been. I think there, you know, there will be a lot of analysis one way or the other if they're able to secure it. Critics sure. of the campaign are critically more generally of the UN and some of the uh, sort of hypocrisies in, in what it pursues or the things that it doesn't pursue and also of the efficacy of having that seat. Does it, you know, you're, you don't have a veto power and, and other countries do. How effective can you be? The Prime Minister's point and the federal government point has been we believe in multilateralism especially at this juncture as you see the United States withdraw from that type of arrangement and from sort of the world leadership on the world stage we believe the substitute for that is a is a sort of punctuated belief in multilateralism and this is the best way to leverage that belief and and leverage our own power I think the Prime Minister said something along the lines of uh, we're you know we know we're, we're big enough that we can make a difference but we're small enough to know that mm -hmm. we can't do it alone that mm -hmm. is kind of the mm -hmm. philosophy that I underscores the pursuit of this seat from uh, from the government's perspective. But like I said, it, that, that campaign has its critics. And I guess chief among them is sort of the criticism we've heard of the Liberals over the, a number of years, which is, you're, and we've heard it within Canada, even around this, this seat, there have been almost some sort of domestic criticism among, you know, someone like David Suzuki, even, who came out and wrote a letter, that they, they talk a lot about moral leadership, but not all of their actions necessarily um, match up with it. So do they, quote unquote, deserve to secure this seat? Ultimately, the representatives of other countries at the UN will make that determination. But you heard the Prime Minister's rationale for, for why he thinks it would be uh, productive for Canada to secure it. And David, your thoughts on that before I let you both go for a moment? Yeah, just uh, on the whole concept of, of multilateralism, this is something this government talks about a lot, and the United Nations Security Council seat has been part of that bid, but it, it's not just this one institution. It's the entire erosion of the sort of the multilateral order that's out there. You know, I've covered four G7s uh, since I've been working here. The first one with Barack Obama, the last three with Donald Trump, and uh, they've each gotten uh, progressively less ambitious and with less unity, and in many ways less effective. And that's not just happening with with the G7. It's been happening with NATO as Trump disrupts that. It's been happening with the World Trade Organization. And, you know, it, and it, for example, he's pulled out of the World Health Organization. And so you need to think about the big problems the world is facing. And to bring it back to COVID, until this virus is controlled in all countries, it's not controlled in any country if we want to resume normal global trade and normal global travel. And it's going to take a great multilateral response, particularly in the developing world, uh, where countries just don't have the money to spend on health care because they're spending it on debt servicing and they can't pay doctors and they can't borrow because of their debt limits. And that's going to take real committed multilateralist voices. Um, in all of these institutions. And now November could change the, the outlook of the United States on these things, who knows. Uh, but it's interesting to hear the way Canada pitches its bid for a seat at the table at the UN Security Council versus what some of the traditional great powers are, are, are doing globally. Um, it, it's, a, it's a delicate time for the world. And, yeah. and, and I think that is the sentiment that Trudeau and them are trying to play into, even though they may not be a perfect candidate, as the legion of critics that Vashi has highlighted mm -hmm. ha have made clear. Uh, and just to remind people, it's 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 really a three-way race for those two seats: Norway, Ireland, Canada. Lots of people believe Norway is a bit of a shoe in uh, but mm -hmm. but we, we we will see. And this is all done uh, in secret. And even if someone tells you we know how it's going to end, the chances <laughs> that they actually do know uh, how They're it's going to end is, is yeah, it's pretty slim. It's pretty yeah. slim. Okay, Vashi, I know you've got a jet off for another interview. Thank you so much for helping us. Thanks. And David, we'll be back to you shortly. Vashi, you can catch her, of course, at five Eastern on Power and Politics. But I want to get some reaction now with my next guest, Asia Sachs works in the restaurant business as of course the hospitality sector has been really severely threatened and, and hurt by the many bars and restaurants that have gone under some of them reopening now but Asia one of those people uh, that did use the Canada emergency relief benefit Asia good to see you Hi, nice to see you too. Thanks so thanks much for, for having me. Oh, thanks for making the time. So uh, you heard the Prime Minister's announcement there, an extension of eight weeks, two more months. Uh, will, will you need that and what do you think of it? 
I will absolutely need that, and I'm by no means the only one. Um, even with restaurants slowly reopening, we're seeing uh, very few people actually being hired back in the front of house in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, in the takeout situation, you need the kitchen, obviously, and you may need one or two people in the front, uh, but obviously just not the sheer number we've needed in the past. So do you think that two months is going to be enough time for things to reopen a little bit more even so that you will be able to get back to work? Or what's your what's your view on that? Well, here's the thing. If we're even in the reopening of uh, restaurants in phases two and three, which I should point out Toronto and the GTA are not included in so far. Right, right. Um, but even when we are we will have to adhere to the socially distanced rules and um, that means that most restaurants are going to have to reduce their capacity by at least 50 percent so what you're going to see is half the staff needed to do that as well so you're going to see a maximum 50 percent higher back rate maximum at restaurants and that's assuming people are going to be coming into restaurants sure, yeah. so you know, because we do rely on tips. And I'd like to take this opportunity, if you don't mind, to point out that even if we claim ta uh, tips on our taxes, it doesn't actually affect our EI. It, mm. Or even um, the bank doesn't recognize it at all either for mortgages. So mm. I, for one, claim all my taxes. I'm 38. I've been doing it for years. And it doesn't impact my EI. So my EI will still be based on wages, which, as you know, being less mm -hmm. than minimum wage, are low. Oh, interesting. Okay, so uh, it, it, was the two thousand bucks enough for you over the past? I guess you've used it for the full cycle, and is it going to yeah. be enough for you for the next two months? For me, it is. I'm very fortunate, as we know in Toronto, rental rates uh, have gotten a little out of control. We'll say to be conservative. Um, I'm lucky enough to have lived in my apartment for a long time, so my rent isn't as exorbitant as others. So the two thousand dollars for me covered my expenses just i wasn't mm -hmm. making uh, any dent in my debt or savings of course yeah. um but it covered my expenses and most of my friends um have found that it covered their basic expenses and when i say basic that means that's not including medication sure. um for example um right. some of my groceries things like that so uh two thousand dollars is the bare minimum particularly for living in a city. And I understand the, the frustration across the country with CERB. Um, I know there's parts of the country where $2,000 is a lot more money and goes yeah. a lot further than it does here. Sure. But we have to be real about that. Uh, I've only got about 30 seconds. H how do you yeah. feel now knowing that you've got another two months of sort of flex here where you don't have to panic and or go further into debt or however you were going to solve that? How do you feel? I feel relieved. I feel um, safer. I mean, I owe, I'm so grateful to live in Canada. Obviously, we have a very lucky situation here. Um, I'm internally, eternally grateful, much more relaxed, and obviously hope that they're open to the fact that this may have to be continually extended right. as uh, surges and upticks in COVID cases come up after we try this reopening, as well as the fact that certain industries like the restaurant industry and film industry yeah. will be hit by this a lot longer than others. Okay, Asia, thank you so much. I appreciate getting thank your you. immediate reaction to that. Take care of yourself <laughs> over the next two Thanks, months. Thanks, you too. Okay, Asia thank Sachs you. in Toronto. She works as a bartender, server, and caterer. We're going to take a short break here on CBC News Network. More of our special coverage, the government's response to COVID-19 right after this.
Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Welcome back to uh, CBC News Network here in Ottawa. We're streaming live around the world on our app, our website. Uh, we are, uh, of course, standing by for the press conference from cabinet uh, ministers and public health officials. At 12.30 Eastern 2, we are expected the COVID committee to take place. The Prime Minister will be there to uh, answer some questions. But the big news from the Prime Minister this morning is that the government will extend the Canada Emergency Response Benefit that so many Canadians tapped into as the uh, shutdown went into effect uh, at the beginning of March. And that extension now will go for another eight weeks. So if you uh, can't get back to work, if your job is not allowing you to go back to work, you'll have a little bit more room to breathe. Uh, we expect that there are some two million Canadians that will still need the, the CERB going forward. So the Prime Minister announcing today that there'll be a two month extension of that. Also confirming some news uh, around the Canada-US border. That too will remain closed uh, to non-essential travel for for another 30 days. As we wait for this press conference to get started, though, I wanted to uh, do a quick interview, if we can, with someone doing something pretty great at a time when lots of people need a little extra hand. And it's in Victoria, BC. There's a nonprofit meal program there, help bringing healthy meals to people who need them most. The Red Cedar Cafe has already delivered, get this, more than 7,000 meals to seniors and other vulnerable people in Victoria. And Liz May is a volunteer and community relations coordinator for the Red Cedar Cafe. And she joins me from the kitchen of the cafe. Uh, good to see you, Liz. Thanks for making the time. Yeah, good morning. Well, I guess it's morning here. Yeah, morning there, <laughs> afternoon here. So you, how did this idea come about? Because it is kind of amazing how much you've been able to do over this period of time. Yeah, it just started recognizing the need uh, for a little extra help during these times. It's um, super challenging for a lot of people um, and a lot of economic hardship that we're facing. Like a lot of people were laid off and folks self-isolating, seniors. So we're just kind of recognizing that even and filling a gap. And you the, and the goal is to get people, I guess, good, healthy, um, home cooked or, you know, cooked by you and your team uh, meals. And, and how are you funding that? Where's the money coming from for that? Yeah, we've been so heartened with the outpouring of support by the community. Like this is this is what mutual aid looks like. We're not getting we don't have any major funders. It's a lot of um, just community members who are participating in the project and donating raw ingredients, um, uh, time or funds to the project. Um, so we've partnered with a lot of um, grocery stores and other food network hubs in the region, um, community centers that ha have been providing um, a lot of the raw ingredients. And then we just get um, some one-off donations from individuals and organizations who just want to support the project and um, feed the people. So you are, are you, it's 700, uh, 7,700 meals since mid-April. How, how do you manage to do that? And were you surprised at the amount of need that was out there? Because it is maybe a little overwhelming to find so many people need that help. Yeah, so uh, we've kind of, it's been a lot of figuring it out as we go. Um, as you can see behind me, like we're in this beautiful space in downtown Victoria that was functioning as um, a traditional restaurant sure. um, three months ago. So we're not in a production kitchen. So uh, we have dialed our operations uh over the last couple of months, but it's on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, we have um, a kitchen lead and about 10 other assistants that are here for about eight hours in and out um, that are creating about 1,200 meals in those those three days. And then we're distributing them on, on Thursdays. Um, and then to your second question, on uh, uh, have we been surprised with the demand and and yeah like w the first week we were um probably providing around 200 meals and that quickly scaled up to 1200 um by the by within a month wow. um so yeah it's it's we're we're filling a demand um but it just keeps growing and uh just kind of showing how big of a need there is For right sure. now what in the community what do you think it has changed for people who uh, were either, you know, worried about going out to get food, didn't have enough money to go get uh, good food? What do you think it's changed for people? Um, oh, since we started, or yeah, yeah, just get uh, just getting those lovely meals that you've prepared at, at a time when things are are difficult. Yeah, it's like. Uh, we have a lot of um, feedback. We have left testimonials on our website and we were getting emails. It's just um, people feel like they feel warm and comforted and like 
it's showing support from other community members. Like we put a lot of love and care into all these meals. We're feeding people with dignity. It's not um, your standard like soup kitchen meals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we have really qualified um, chefs that are working with us because the whole hospitality industry has been on pause. And um, myself included, I'm uh, worked in hospitality for years and we all just want to still, still continue in the sector but uh, it's, it's really fun and we're just giving back to the community. So what's gonna happen post COVID? I mean, eventually that will happen one day or at least there'll be more things opening. What will happen to the program after? Have you given that any thought? Definitely, yeah. We're, we're trying to figure out exactly what our scope is. Um, we've been quite busy over the last couple of months um, just getting food to the people and we'll continue to do that. That will be our priority always is um, to get healthy, affordable meals to folks who need it. Um, there's no shortage of demand. So I think if we could just continue providing the 1,000 to 1,200 meals a week, we're doing a great job. Um, and we also, like a lot of Canadians, are just... Um, looking ahead to the recovery for, mm -hmm. for, um, from COVID-19 and doing it in a just, equitable, fair, safe, and healthy way um, that doesn't leave anyone behind. That's great. Liz May, it's so nice to hear people coming up with uh, really cool solutions for difficult times and trying to help people in different ways. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good luck with it all. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. That's Liz May. She's a volunteer and the community relations coordinator for the Red Cedar Cafe in Victoria. Okay, we are waiting uh, still, of course, for cabinet ministers to give us some more specifics, perhaps around what the prime minister announced not too long ago, the extension of CERB for another two months for people that need it, $2,000, of course. Um, and of course, that number has gone down over time as some Canadians go back to work, as some industries reopen, uh, or as some companies tap into the wage subsidy. But there's still as many as 2 million Canadians that need some additional support um, because their jobs may simply just not exist, might not come back or are not coming back yet. So let me bring in my co uh, colleague, David Cochran, <laughs> again, uh, to talk a little bit more about that. And uh, so we're going to hear from, uh, from people now. The Prime Minister will be at the COVID committee at 12.30, uh, where mm -hmm. he'll take some questions as well, David. But um, uh, we heard uh, from Asia, the, the restaurant worker and caterer, how, how big a relief that is, particularly in a big city, of course, where 2,000 bucks doesn't go as far as it does in, in, in places where we're from, for instance, Winnipeg and, and St. John's. But um, I, I don't, I, she also was already signaling, you know, I hope the government thinks about what happens after that. And of course, it's so hard for anyone to know what happens after that and, and how much more that may have to continue or change or evolve in a different way. I must admit, I'm surprised that it is just a, a straight rollover and that it didn't get altered in a, in a really significant way. I would imagine the next version of that would not be exactly the same, you would think. Yeah, I mean, we may there may be some uh, tweaks in the regulations that sure. Jean-Yves Duclos or maybe Carla Qualtro can tell us about during mm -hmm. this news conference, because it tends to be the Prime Minister announced the broad strokes and then the fine print uh, comes from the ministers in these briefings. But they've kind of done two things here with this. Uh, they've obviously given uh, extended the lifeline that a lot of people need to make it through these difficult times but they've also bought themselves some time uh, to get a, a more data and a clearer sense of, of where this is going to go and what changes they need to make. I mean, we are still very early in the economic reopening in a lot of places, uh, though certain regions of the country have done, are, are quite advanced in the elimination or the reduction or containment of COVID-19, primarily, say, Atlantic Canada, for example. Um, we still don't precisely know uh, how this opening is going to go, and we won't know for a couple of weeks in a lot of places when because of the lag uh, in symptoms manifesting and with cases showing up and, and this sort of a thing. Uh, so yeah, they do need to figure out what they're going to do with CERB. You can't just keep pumping out $2,000 yeah. a month to millions of Canadians with no end in sight with no transition uh, back to work and without also a recognition of the regional differences. For mm -hmm, example, mm -hmm, you could mm -hmm. go back to work in Prince Edward Island or in Newfoundland and Labrador. I mean, Labrador, as far as I know, has not even had any cases. Uh, so, you know, as long as the provincial health authorities and the local health authorities allow that opening up, there should be able to be a, a quicker return to normal there and then a drawdown on the CERB. So we don't have a price tag on this decision mm -hmm, today, mm -hmm. 43 billion to date, but you can expect with the reopening that the uptake would decline over time, so you expect the number to go down. Some of the costs will shift to the wage subsidy as more businesses reopen and, and, and rehire people and, and rely on the subsidy, and you can't get both at the same time. But you know, this is an announcement today, Rosie, that comes with a price tag 
in the tens of billions. Sure. Uh, it's just not precisely clear from what the Prime Minister has told us exactly where they pr pr expect that to be. And we might not know for a while until we see exactly how quickly the reopenings, uh, how well the reopenings go. Yeah, but such a relief, I would imagine. I mean, you heard from our, our oh, yeah. guest there, Asia, and such a relief for so many other people who just don't see themselves returning to work and also are concerned about the, the safety aspect of returning to work. I know that, uh, you know, the Conservatives have expressed concerns around people not wanting mm -hmm. to go back to work. But if, if you can't, if the job isn't there or the job is, uh, you know, has not enough hours to support you, I'm not sure what, what your choice is in that situation. Yeah, you've, you've got the story like Asia who works in, in, yeah. in, in the service industry. So bars and restaurants are coming back with reduced capacity. And who knows how comfortable people are going to be going out. The patios I've seen in Ottawa, there's people on them, but they are half capacity and with fewer staff uh, that you'd see. But, you know, I, I, I interviewed a woman yesterday, Rebecca Gray. She's from Ottawa. She lives in Toronto. She was on the national, uh, the story. I did on the National last night about the signal that the promise that they're going to extend CERB. In normal times, she works five jobs. She, you know, she, she teaches music, she's a singer, she's in a choir, she's an usher at concert halls, but all of these are dependent on singing in crowded spaces. Yeah. And the science has taught us singing is a really bad thing to do during this pandemic because it becomes like a super spreading episode in, in terms of just the spittle and the volume of stuff that goes out as people project and sing. So while she's willing to go back to work, those venues are not opening up sure. even during the reopening. So in very sort of specific sectors, there's kind of no obvious hope mm -hmm. now compared mm -hmm. to what there even was in March when the country right. really started to go into lockdown. Restaurants and bars reopening, concert halls, not so much. Yeah, and it's the same for actually much of the arts community. You know, if you can't have concerts, you, the film industry has been put on hold, TV production, all those, well, the exception of the news, uh, <laughs> all those kinds of things have been put on hold. So there are people uh, in, in creative fields as well, uh, you know, very, very concerned, as well as um, people who are self-employed, who rely on contracts and, and, and trying to build up um, a salary over time. So obviously uh, the extension of the CERB would be a relief to a lot of people, but mm -hmm. we'll wait and see from cabinet ministers here about some of the details and whether anything else has substantively changed uh, in terms of the announcement. So um, as well as that, we are waiting. Uh, we do know again that the that they have extended the border shutdown by another 30 days to the end of July, which um, is no surprise in, in part because we, we knew that already. But it's also no surprise because when you see what's happening in the United States, um, there doesn't seem to be any case to be made for I, I would imagine on both sides, but particularly for us, to allow any sort of additional travel back and forth at this stage. Yeah, and that would be the Deputy Prime Minister's role. Christopher Freeland is going to be at yeah. this news conference today. She still has responsibility for Canada-U.S. relations, uh, despite the fact that uh, Minister Champagne is the Foreign Affairs Minister and Bill Blair is the Border Minister. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's hard to see a case for reopening it beyond uh, where it is right now. Um, the, the transmission rates in Canada are below one. They're bending the curve down. You're getting to a point where it's quite good in many, in most provinces. Still some hot spots in, in the two biggest provinces uh, here in central Canada. Um, America is a very different story, right? The, mm -hmm. the reopening, especially in the southern and midwestern states, has led to some uh, pretty big spikes. Um, the president said yesterday that if they simply stopped testing, they wouldn't have any new cases, which is, uh, I, I think, troubling for epidemiologists and scientists to hear uh, that that might be a, a solution to stopping this. But, you know, presidential politics, uh, the electoral cycle that's happening in the United States, the, the, the importance of the economy at the center of the political conversation there is to, seems to me to be at a much higher degree than in Canada where yeah. collective social well-being is, is a dominant concern. And, and given that, the, there's no hurry on the Canadian side to do it. And, and perhaps fortunately, Rosie, um, Donald Trump likes thick borders and uh, this gives mm -hmm. him an excuse mm -hmm. to have one at both sides of his country. Yeah, the political uh, part of that calculation, obviously pretty critical for a president yeah. who, who um, really thought he was going to get reelected on, on the state of the economy and on the performance of the markets, and that has proven uh, difficult over the past number yes. of months. Okay, David, I'll come back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, and we will go now to our briefing, and there is the Deputy Prime Minister, Christy Freeland. Development and Disability Inclusion. Carla Qualtra. Et bien sûr, le Président du Conseil du Trésor. And, of course, the President of the Treasury Board, Jean-Yves Duclos. Good afternoon and bon après-midi à tous. As usual, I will begin with an update on the latest numbers for COVID-19 in Canada. There are now 99,000. 
147 cases, including 8,175 deaths, and 61,042, or 62%, have now recovered. Labs across Canada have tested over 2,183,000 people for COVID-19 to date. Over the past week, we have tested an average of 33,000 people daily, with 2% testing positive. These numbers do change quickly, and they're updated daily in the evenings on canada.ca slash coronavirus. Today, I want to stop and reflect uh, a little bit on the numbers. Although we read and post these numbers online every day, we can't forget that there is so much more behind them. Every case is a person with family, friends and community who have been confronted with the illness and its uncertain outcomes. Some people have endured painful separation from their loved ones during severe illness and hospitalization, and many have suffered the unspeakable pain of a loved one lost to COVID-19. As I take a step back to reflect on the human stories behind the numbers today, I want to acknowledge the lives we have lost and to offer my sympathy to those who continue to grieve their loss the deepest. I don't think there is a day that has gone by when Canadians haven't considered what these numbers really mean. And I know that it's been a big part of what has united and driven us to make sacrifices to stop the virus from doing even more damage. So for those moments that we're tired of this new way of life, it helps to look back at what we've sacrificed, but also to consider the progress we've made and to gather our strength and resolve to continue forward together. Yesterday, we reached a new milestone in the percentage of cases that have recovered, with over 60% of all cases recovered. This is a sign that the epidemic has slowed enough that the new cases are no longer overtaking, though, coming off the long road to recovery. It also means that we've protected the health system and have been able to support severely ill cases through the worst of their illness. However, even though the epidemic growth has slowed considerably across the country, and we can now see these hopeful signs, this is the part where we gather our strength and resolve to continue our efforts. Because it may only take one new case of COVID-19 to spark an outbreak or renewed epidemic growth that could change our trajectory. The hard truth is that COVID-19 is still very much with us. There is no room for complacency with COVID-19. We all need to keep up with public health measures to maintain epidemic control. That means there is only one way to go out, and that is to go out smart, with physical distancing, frequent hand washing and cough etiquette. This includes wearing a non-medical mask in areas where COVID-19 is still active and you can't keep the two meter, meter distance from others. Most importantly, if you have any symptoms, even if mild, it is vital that you stay home and away from others to prevent spreading the virus. Thank you. Merci. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tam. I met Nanjou Don La Parola, Dr. Haudin. Dr. Nu, s'il vous plaît. Dr. Nu, you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon. As usual, I will begin with an update on the latest numbers for COVID-19 in Canada. There are now 99,147 cases, including 8,175 deaths and 61,042, or 62% have now recovered. Labs across Canada have tested over 2,183,000 people for COVID-19 to date. Over the past week, we have tested an average of 33,000 people daily with 2% testing positive. These numbers change quickly and are updated daily in the evenings on canada.ca slash coronavirus. Today, instead of moving on to another topic, I want to stop and reflect on the numbers. Although we read and post these numbers online every day, we can't forget that there is so much more behind them. Every case is a person with family, friends and community who have been confronted with the illness and its uncertain outcomes. Some people have endured painful separation from their loved ones during severe illness and hospitalization, and many have suffered the unspeakable pain of a loved one lost to COVID-19. As I take a step back to reflect on the human stories behind the numbers today, I want to acknowledge the lives we have lost and to offer my sympathy to those who continue to grieve their loss the deepest.
I don't think there is a day that has gone by when Canadians haven't considered what these numbers really mean. And we know it's been a big part of what has united and driven us to make sacrifices to stop this virus from doing even more damage. So for those moments that we tire of this new way of life, it helps to look back at what we've sacrificed, but also to consider the progress we've made and to gather our strength and resolve to continue forward together. Yesterday we reached a new milestone in the percentage of cases that have recovered, with over 60% of all cases recovered. This is a sign that the epidemic has slowed enough that new cases are no longer overtaking those coming off the road to recovery. It also means that we've protected the health system and have been able to support severely ill cases through the worst of their illness. However, even though the epidemic growth has slowed considerably across the country and we can now see these hopeful signs, this is the part where we gather our strength and resolve to continue our efforts, because it may take only one new case of COVID-19 to spark an outbreak or renewed epidemic growth that could change our trajectory. Trajectory. The hard truth is that COVID-19 is still very much with us. There is no room for complacency with COVID-19. We all need to keep up with public health measures to maintain epidemic control. That means there is only one way to go out. And that is to go out smart, with physical distancing, frequent hand washing, and cough etiquette. This includes wearing a non-medical mask in areas where COVID-19 is still active, and you can't keep two-meter distances from others. Most importantly, if you have any symptoms, even if mild, it is vital that you stay home and away from others to prevent spreading the virus. Thank you. Merci, Dr. Knu. Thank you, Dr. New. We'll hear from our Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Disability Inclusion, Carla Qualtro. Carla, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to join you today to provide an update on the actions being taken by our government to support Canadians impacted by COVID-19 as we carefully and safely reopen our economy. We all know and agree that the best way to bring back the economy quickly and efficiently is by helping Canadians get back to work. We know that approximately 1.2 million Canadians who were getting financial help through the CERB are no longer in need of it. We also know that as of June 16th, over 223,000 employers have applied for the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, supporting over 2.6 million employees across the country. Les récents chiffres sur l'emploi ont montré Recent job numbers have shown positive progress in terms of people returning to the workforce, but have also shown us that many Canadians are still struggling. In the extension of the CERB by eight weeks, at the current rate of $500 per week. We know that this will go a long way for Canadians who simply don't have a job to return to, and for workers in industries that haven't yet reopened. Extending the CERB will give workers greater confidence that they will continue to get the support they need as they face ongoing disruptions to their work and home situations due to COVID-19. The CERB will continue to be available from March 15th to October 3rd. In that time period, workers will now have 24 weeks of the CERB available to them. While the CERB has been helping millions of Canadian workers get through this difficult time, we know that this benefit is not a long-term solution. We are moving from a phase in the pandemic where we were, we were asking everyone to stay home to a phase where workers are going back to work when it is safe and possible for them to do so. We want to ensure that our programs continue to support Canadians and our economy, and that is why, over the next weeks, we will continue to monitor the situation and ensure that, come September, we are able to adapt our existing systems to support Canadian workers as more and more people continue to return to the labour market. Canadians are ready and eager to do their part. We expect that workers will be seeking work opportunities or returning to work when their employer reaches out to them, provided they are able and it is reasonable to do so. We encourage Canadians to consult the Job Bank, Canada's National Employment Service, that offers tools to help with job searches. These expectations will be clearly set out in the CERB attestation. As I've said many times before, together we will get through this. Thank you. Merci beaucoup.
Okay, thank you very much, Carla. And now I give the floor to the President of the Conseil du Trésor, Jean-Yves Duclos. Now the President of the Treasury Board, Jean-Yves Duclos. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Two important announcements this morning made by the Prime Minister. The first on the extension of our agreement with the United States on our shared border, both to maintain and protect the health of Canadians and to protect, protect and maintain the flow of people for essential uh, reasons. Et la deuxième annonce, c'est celle que the second announcement, our colleague Carla just summarized it, it's our extension by eight weeks of the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit with some conditions that will take into consideration some significant improvements, yet still modest improvements with respect to the labor market. There's also an attestation uh, that has to be signed, and it includes uh, the fact that a person would accept work when reasonable to do so and safe to do so. Also, the uh, job bank, uh, the Government of Canada's job bank, which will mean that more and more jobs, the, more, the increasing number of jobs showing up in the next few weeks can be matched with uh, certain available workers. So so this context takes into consideration evolution in the labor market, while at the same time recognizing that there still are millions of Canadians today who are facing many difficulties to trying to find work and a really hard time making ends meet. We are now prepared to respond to your questions. Mr. As usual, we'll start with three questions on the phone, one question, one follow-up, and then we'll turn to the room. Operator, over to you. Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. Veuillez s'il vous plaît appuyer sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. La première question est de Raymond Fulian de TVA. À vous la parole. TVA, question for Mr. Duclos. The question was asked of Mr. Trudeau this morning in a scrum, but we didn't get an answer. With respect to the cost of this eight-week extension, what do you assess that to be? Answer, very good question, two quick answers. First, costs will, of course, evolve over the coming weeks. Initially, we already know them. My colleague uh, Carla will be able to give you some specifics as to the cost. Costs were higher at first. We've already seen a significant decrease in the cost of the CERB for good reason. And that's because there are 1.2 million Canadians who are no longer asking for it because they no longer need it. And if I can say as an aside that given the good results uh, that the Statistics Canada shared with us 12 or so days ago on June 5th, Statistics Canada said there were 300,000 new jobs created. However, we expect that these costs will continue to decrease over the coming weeks because, as we said a few moments ago, we expect more and more employers to turn to the wage subsidy. Therefore, fewer workers will need the CERB. Question, what is your... We'll do that in English. Uh, briefly, in English, uh, we are uh, you know, mindful that uh, the costs of the CERB have changed over the last few weeks, and for good reasons, as uh, Minister Qualtro, and she might want to, uh, to uh, make that even more precise, has said. Now, initially, we had a, a large number of CERB recipients because we wanted those Canadians to be away from, from work for health reasons. That has changed over the last few weeks. Minister Qualtro did mentioned that 1.2 million Canadians didn't need to serve anymore because they had found a new job. Now, we expect that trend to continue over the next few weeks because we expect more and more Canadians to be able to switch to the emergency wage subsidies and therefore not to receive the CERB anymore. At the start of June, it cost $44 billion for the CERB. At, at its highest, it represented 
17 billion per month. As my colleague said, things are changing. Okay, if you want to keep watching this and press conference, you can do so uh, live streaming on our website, cbc.ca slash politics. But for now, we're going to take you inside the West Block, where the a hybrid meeting of the Special Committee on COVID-19 is just underway. And the leader of the official opposition, Andrew Scheer, is asking questions of the Prime Minister. Let's listen to that now. Live. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the very beginning, we, we, we knew that as we rolled out measures, we would need to improve them and tweak them. And that's exactly what we've been doing over the past three months. Uh, we needed to make measures happen quickly for Canadians, and we did. But we continued to improve, uh, to make um, additions and amendments so that more people could get the help they need, including with the proposed legislation last week that expanded the reach of the wage subsidy to more businesses. Unfortunately, the Conservatives didn't even want us to debate that particular piece of legislation. Mr. Scheer. Actually, Mr. Speaker, it was Liberals who said no to the motion to allow this Parliament to sit to debate that motion. And even in that legislation, they refused to allow businesses who have made acquisitions to access the program. Now, when we look at the rent relief program, it is so difficult to apply for that many landlords are refusing to bother, leaving even more small businesses to fall through the cracks. In fact, of the $3 billion allocated to the rent relief program, only $39 million have been paid out. That's less than 2%. Now, the Prime Minister is still using talking points from April. It's now June, and he's refused to fix these programs, and he's successfully talked out the calendar on the days that the House of Commons could meet to discuss these programs. So when will he make these changes to get more help to Canadians who need it? Honourable Prime Minister. Throughout this pandemic, we have constantly been updating and expanding our various programs. Uh, we recognize in conversations with the Premiers how important it is uh, to make sure that we're working together, provinces and federal government, on issues like rent subsidies, where uh, commercial rent is indeed a provincial jurisdiction. Many provinces have moved forward with uh, the eviction bans that are necessary to go along with this and we will continue to work with provinces to make sure uh, that we're getting Canadians the help they need. Mr. Scheer. Mr. Speaker, Keynes cannot wait. He has run down the clock on parliamentary sittings and he still refuses to make these changes to get more help to Canadians. Now, Mr. Speaker, today we learned that TELUS has installed Huawei technology in downtown Ottawa. There are over 80 sites across the national capital region that have Huawei technology installed. Some of these sites are very near sensitive government institutions like government departments, the National Research Council, RCMP headquarters and the Bank of Canada. How long has the the Prime Minister known that Huawei technology has been installed in the Ottawa area. Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, first off on the issue of Parliament. Parliament has been meeting four times a week over the past many weeks and members of the opposition have been able to continue to ask questions on COVID-19 and on a broad range of subjects. Uh, and indeed, every two weeks the Finance Department puts forward uh, the full transparent measures of what we've done at Finance Committee so that uh, parliamentarians can study it. We are continuing to work uh, in this crisis. At the same time, on... Uh, sorry? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, at the same time, in regards uh, to Huawei technology, uh, there are strict rules for companies to follow, and we assume that they all will follow those. Yeah. Okay, we'll uh, pause for a second, stop the clock. I want to remind the honourable members uh, who are joining us virtually that heckling really does disrupt the whole session, and uh, <laughs> your face does come up, and we do see who it is, so I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. Uh, and now uh, we'll go back to Mr. Scheer. We have a minute and 10 seconds left. Please proceed. Mr. Speaker, if the Prime Minister is bragging about accountability and transparency, will he table an economic update before the House rises? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, throughout this unprecedented pandemic, we have been open and transparent about all the measures we've put forward. We've updated the Finance Committee. Go back to Mr. Scheer. Mr. Very Scheer. long way of saying no, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has pursued a policy of appeasement in pursuit of a personal vanity product at the UN. Uh, he, in the process, he's cozied up to dictators and human rights violators. He's abandoned Israel and committed funding to UNRWA, an organization whose schools have been used as storage facilities for Hamas rockets to be used against Israeli civilians and whose facilities have served as breeding grounds for racism and anti-Semitism. He has apologized for the Iranian regime when they shot down a plane full of Canadian citizens, and he refuses to list the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist entity. So, what's the point of having a seat at the table if you have to sell out Canadian principles to get there? The right Honourable Prime Minister.
Minister. Mr. Speaker, we see that Conservatives have uh, kept with the Harper approach to international diplomacy. The failed Standing presence of Canada on the world stage uh, uh, was an embarrassment for many Canadians for many, many years. Uh, and that's why when we took office five years ago, uh, we demonstrated the kind of leadership on values that Canadians expected. And we will continue to work around the world to defend multilateralism. We have a point of order, or Ms. May? This being a committee, we can have a point of order during what would have been question period, but I am not sitting that far away from the Prime Minister, and I'm sorry, but Andrew Scheer used to be the Speaker of the House. He should show better decorum. <laughs> We have a point of order coming from Mr. Genius. Mr. Speaker, on the same point of order, it is disgusting for the leader of the Green Party uh, to use decorum as an excuse to interrupt the leader of the opposition in the middle of critical lines of questioning. The leader of the Green Party knows the rules of this House and shouldn't be abusing them uh, to, to advance a partisan agenda. Getting into debate, and I do want to point out that the time had run out, and we're now moving on to the next line of I'm questions. Point. Oh, uh, the point of order, uh, Mr. Shear. I appreciate the Honourable Leader of the Green Party, Elizabeth May, for that reminder. When I was Speaker, I always appreciated her help and advice about how to improve decorum in here. And I just want to say to the member and to all members, the reason why I could not control myself was the Prime Minister used the word embarrassment in answering a foreign affairs question, and it just made me think of the India trip. I, I believe we're getting into debate and uh, arguments, so maintenant nous allons... Now we're going to move on to Mr. Blanchet. Mr. Blanchet, while the Greens and the Conservatives, uh, that they'll be meeting each other out back afterwards. The Prime Minister extended the serve, and that's good news, but this isn't enough. Last week, there was an emergency to fight fraud, and in our view, there was also an urgent need to adjust CERB to meet the needs of tourism, artists, farmers, as we've seen, who will be lacking HR. Where has this urgent emergency gone? How come the government is refusing to discuss with the opposition parties? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I'm very happy, Chair, to hear the Honourable Member finally aligning with the Liberal Party's position. Unfortunately, it's one week too late. They should have let, let us debate this last week when it was in front of the House. Mr. Blanchet, I have the impression that this is just a fantasy in his mind, but we clearly proposed to extend debate to reach an agreement, which leads me to my second question. Last week, Week, the assistance to persons with disabilities was a key issue, and it's even more so now, a week later. The Bloc proposed an, to extend discussions and to split the bill to help persons with disabilities. How come the government is refusing this aid for people with disabilities, even though it could have e decently discussed this with opposition parties, as it's a minority government? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Chair, this is exactly what we wanted. Unfortunately, we needed unanimous consent of the House, and one party, namely the Conservatives, voted against that unanimous consent to be able to de debate these issues. Unfortunately, we are going to have to take other measures to help people living with disabilities. Mr. Blanchet. Since everything was so wonderful, how come we don't try this again? Why don't we open dialogue now? What is preventing the Prime Minister from bringing people together and saying, we'll sit down and discuss this issue instead of... Uh, and, and uh, people with disabilities won't have the assistance that they need. On October 21st, the Prime Minister received a minority mandate from Canadians. How come the Prime Minister can't stop acting like a, mi a majority, uh, like he holds a majority, like he's a monarch? Chair, I've heard the Conservatives and the Bloc Québécois in their accusations, but what they're not telling us is that there was consent of the House to proceed with the special COVID committee until end June. Three parties agreed on this, and which is what we need in a minority setting. We worked with the other parties because they didn't obtain the result they wanted. Now they're complaining, but unfortunately, they all 
also are in a minority parliament, and we have to respect the will of the majority in this party, just like we do. Mr. Blanchet, I could have been tempted, but I'm not the prime minister. He is. That's his job to bring people together. It's his job to have conversations. It's his job to call back the parliament. All we asked for was a couple of hours to, to, to discuss this, and they said, no, this doesn't work. We're not. That's something strange. And moreover, the government wants to spend 14 million in Quebec's jurisdiction, and Quebec and other provinces are refusing this interference, and they want this money to be paid without strings. Can, is the prime minister trying to benefit from this crisis, or is he trying to create a constitutional crisis, the honorable prime minister? Chair, the responsibility of all levels of government, well, their priority is the security of Canadians. That's why we proposed $14 billion to ensure Canadians across the country we'll see a safe reopening of the economy. And we're working on this proposal now with the provinces because we know that across the country the needs, whether it's in terms of early daycare centers or testing centers or support for municipalities, we need this countrywide, and the federal government wants to be there to help the provinces. Now we're going to continue with Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Indigenous leaders have expressed a lack of confidence in the RCMP Commissioner's ability to tackle full-scale systemic racism. But the Prime Minister has expressed his confidence in the Commissioner. What's that based on? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the past two years, Commissioner Lucky has uh, made significant strides forward uh, on an issue where there is still much more to do. Uh, we know that systemic racism exists in all our institutions across. We'll now go back to Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. This is the same RCP Commissioner that just recently said they couldn't explain what systemic racism was. And now the Prime Minister says he has confidence when Indigenous leaders express their lack of confidence. Why does the Prime Minister believe the RCMP Commissioner can tackle systemic racism in the RCMP? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, systemic racism is something that uh, touches every corner of our country, every corner of our institutions, and requires people to uh, understand and move forward in, constant, in, in co uh, coordinated ways with partners. The Commissioner is committed to doing that alongside members of our government. We will do that together and work with Indigenous communities and Black. We'll now go back to Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Speaker, recent events have made it abundantly clear that to tackle the systemic racism at the level of the RCMP, we need a full-scale overhaul, overhaul of the RCMP. Is the Prime Minister committed to a full-scale overhaul of the RCMP to root out systemic racism? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. As I've said many times, Mr. Speaker, I am committed to addressing systemic racism in this country and taking significant, bold actions uh, to reduce the amount of discrimination that Indigenous peoples, uh, that uh, racialized Canadians face on a daily basis. We have much work to do, but we will do it together. Mr. Singh. Speaker, Black Lives Matter have been calling for governments to defund the police. What they're saying is we need to be better at where we spend our money, investing in communities, not policing. Now, will the Prime Minister commit to a review of the RCM budget to allocate resources to community services and not to policing? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, over the past years, we have been investing more directly and more money uh, in community organizations, in the black community, uh, working with Indigenous partners on the path to reconciliation. We have been investing in the kinds of community-based programs and solutions that are part of the solution, but we know there is much more to do, and we will continue to look at all of our expenditures to make sure we're doing Back to Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Well, Mr. Speaker, over the past few years, while this Prime Minister has been in office, the RCMP budget has increased by 31%. So more money is going towards policing. And I asked the Prime Minister, 
You know, in recent events, we've seen people who needed a health care response to a health care crisis be killed by the RCMP. Does the Prime Minister believe that we need to be investing in a health care response instead of a police response to people who are faced with a crisis? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite well knows that it's not an either-or. We need to make sure that our systems across the board, from our police systems to our judicial systems to our health care systems to our community systems, are actually addressing the systemic discrimination issues that are embedded within them. And that is exactly what we are going to continue to do uh, in the coming years. Mr. Singh. Mr. Speaker, with the CERB extension, can the Prime Minister guarantee that everyone who is receiving CERB payments now will continue to do so without any gaps throughout the summer? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to highlight that many Canadians who were on the CERB are now returning to work. Many more who are on the CERB uh, now will be returning to work in the coming weeks. We know that as the economy gets back to work, uh, people will want themselves to get back to work. We'll now go back to Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Can the Prime Minister reassure people? who need it, that, he will con that they will continue to receive the CERB throughout the summer? Yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Chair, we're very happy to highlight that we're extending the CERB for another eight weeks because there are many people who will need it. Even if they want to go back to work, there won't be enough jobs for everyone, so we'll be there for them as we have been since the beginning. We will now go to... Okay, there we go. We're having trouble with my mic down here. Uh, we're going to pause and suspend uh, proceedings just for a few moments, just to allow uh, the uh, staff to and our support staff uh, to substitute each other in a healthy and safe way. Okay, that is also the end of the first round of questions inside the special COVID committee. Uh, the Prime Minister taking questions uh, on CERB because that has now been extended for two months. Jagmeet Singh wanting to make sure that all the people that have qualified it will continue to qualify for it if you uh, continue to be out of work. But uh, let us bring you back to Toronto because just moments ago, you might have been watching online, Ontario Premier Doug Ford gave his statement uh, to the, the province's response. There are 184 new cases being reported well, good afternoon. today. Let's listen in. As thousands and thousands of people in Ontario get back to work, get back out into their communities, as we get the economy going again, we need to give people confidence and peace of mind. We need to make sure that people have the confidence to re-engage with the economy, the confidence to get out and shop at local stores, the confidence to get back on public transit. We need folks to have the confidence to get back to work. And that means ensuring we have the necessary hospital capacity. It means rebuilding our PPE stockpiles. It means keeping the testing numbers as high as they have been. And it means putting in necessary workplace safety measures because nobody wants to see our economy up and running more than I do. But we have to get it right. The worst thing we could do is rush into reopening. Health and safety must come first. Over the past few weeks, we've taken steps to build the necessary confidence that will help everyone prepare, adapt, and get our economy going again. That means giving employers confidence that they have what they have and can open their doors. They also means giving workers confidence, and we have to give customers confidence. And that's how we will get our economy roaring once again. And as more regions are set to enter stage two this Friday, we're going to make it even easier for businesses to inspire that confidence where it matters most. Today, I'm proud to announce the release of a new toolkit, the COVID-19 Safety Plan Guide. This toolkit builds on many supports we have already provided to businesses to help them prepare for reopening, including over 133 sector-specific workplace safety guidance documents. This toolkit will help give businesses, employees, and customers and consumers the confidence they need to resume business as usual. It will help businesses identify risks, take steps to make their workplace safe, 
and help them develop their own tailored safety plan. This is about giving businesses and owners the tools and resources they need to adopt and succeed in this new reality and giving their employees and customers the confidence they need to keep supporting businesses as they reopen. And it's up to all of us, it's up to everyone to support our local businesses during these difficult times. So let's take pride in our incredible Ontario small businesses and manufacturers. Let's support local by Ontario because we have the best of the best right here in Ontario. So let's all shop local this summer, plan your vacation at one of our incredible Ontario destinations. And together, we will support each other through this. My friends, we're all in this together. Thank you, and God bless the people of Ontario. Now, I'll pass it over to Minister McNaughton. Okay, that's Premier Doug Ford, uh, the Premier of Ontario. As uh, much as uh, of this province much, moves Premier. into a new phase, let me take you, we're jumping around a lot today, let me take you back to Ottawa for a little more from Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam. It's very important for us to actually examine the results uh, very carefully uh, before making any uh, further recommendations. And I would say that it would be the clinical expertise that will be uh, applied in Canada to look at that. Merci, Dr. Tam. On va prendre deux dernières questions au téléphone. We'll take two, two last, last questions, questions over the phone. Operator. Thank you. Merci. The next question, la prochaine question, est de Micheline Laflamme de Radio-Canada. À vous la parole. Radio-Canada. Hello, Dr. New. I'd like to hear what you have to say about this dexamethasone drug, if you could answer that. And once you've seen these uh, studies, if it seems as though this drug can be of use and these studies are conclusive, how long would it take before we could get the, this drug in use in the hospitals? Answer, thank you for your question. As uh, Dr. Tang has just said, we are aware. We've also seen the news and reports in the media. Of course, we look forward to reading these results in a scientific publications. Um, this analysis is what we're going to be also discussing with our counterparts throughout the provinces and territories and researchers throughout Canada. If the results really are as uh, conclusive, or perhaps these, these are very optimistic results, it's certainly something that could be considered. It, there would potentially then also be um, research studies in Canada. It's not only about uh, what can be done in the hospitals, but also continuing on, on with the research. Science evolves. One single study um, is not enough to, for us to use it throughout the country. We have to approach this uh, cautiously. We have to turn to these results and also have discussions with scientists as to the next steps in order for us to consider a study here in Canada. If we do do that, I think uh, we have expertise in Canada, we have a network, it's well established. If we do decide to have these studies done in Canada, it could be done swiftly. Thank you. Micheline, a follow-up? Okay, if you want to keep watching that press conference, go to cbc.ca. Everyone's having dueling press conferences today, but the Premier of Ontario is taking a few questions, so we want to take you back to that and get some of those answers now. ...about getting rid of regulations. So just until people understand, uh, I'll use Ford because we're talking about it. Ford Motor Company has to go to headquarters in Dearborn and sell them why they should have another line up here in Oakville. And if we're competing against other U.S. plants or down in Mexico, uh, we have to give them a reason to solve Ontario. And if we if they go in there and there's endless regulations and, and red tape and they can't get through it and uh, we don't create an environment to be competitive, then we're going to lose a lot of companies. But I don't intend on doing that. I intend on making sure we cut regulations, cut red tape, making sure we have an environment that the companies can thrive and prosper, so therefore the employees will thrive and prosper. There's over 4,000 employees out in Oakville that are relying on uh, Ford getting another model to, to produce. So if it means me going, going down after these borders open up and 
you know, and, and we can we can travel. It might be a few months down the road. I'll be at the front door of uh, the world headquarters for Ford, banging down their door, selling them why Ontario is the best place to manufacture cars anywhere in the world. We have some of the top manufacturers anywhere in the world, right here in Ontario. We have the best people in the world manufacturing cars right here in Ontario. I'll put our people up against anyone, anywhere in the world. We have the best here in Ontario. Okay, next question. Next question comes from Christina Tanalia from CP24. Please go ahead. Hi, Christina. Hi, Premier. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking my question. I, I know, Premier, you touched on this already, but more specifically, wondering what your response is to Mark and Mayor Scarpetti's call to make masks mandatory in public places because of the concern that people from Toronto and Peel region, for example, will go to other regions like Markham, who are moving into stage two on Friday. That's the specific request, mandatory yeah. masks. So I'll, I'll be having a conversation with Mayor Scarpitti uh, the, this afternoon re regarding that. Um, we have to encourage people, and I, I apologize, Christina, this is the reason we started early, because of the, the bells go off, but um, I'll be having that conversation, and I highly, highly recommend you go outside, um, and you're in, in large groups, you're in shopping uh, centres, wear a mask. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's, it's critical that you do that, but the police 14 and a half million people would be very, very difficult. We just don't have the manpower, manpower for uh, bylaw and, and uh, police officers to be chasing people without masks. Everyone's been great, so let's continue moving forward. The numbers are going down, uh, all because of the people of Ontario have followed the protocol. Okay. We'll uh, wrap it there. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about the bells, everyone. That's the reason we start at 12.30. We'll see you tomorrow at 12.30 again. Thank you. the Premier of Ontario wrapping up his press conference today that we carried live, sort of, and, and a lot of it online, uh, leaving because the bells were calling them uh, into the legislature. That is one of the, um, the, the issues that you have to deal with with live TV, and the Premier says they'll be back around the same time. But Ontario, as you know, moving into a reopening in, in a vast majority of the province, uh, with some exceptions around uh, Toronto and the GTA, but again, registering less than uh, 200 cases cases again for another day in a row, which shows a real uh, positive sign. The Premier was also asked about uh, the migrant worker situation because, as you know, Mexico has put a stop to sending more Mexican migrant workers into Canada because of the death of two of those workers. The Premier says that they have opened a testing centre in Essex, which is part of the region where those uh, mi migrant workers would be going. Uh, and he encourages farmers and employees to use it. But obviously that will be a cause for concern for Ontario, for Quebec and many other provinces that depend so much on those temporary foreign workers. All right, I will leave you with the news that the Prime Minister gave just a couple hours ago, of course, and that is that the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, or CERB, will be extended for the two million or so Canadians that still need it. So that's a di an additional two months of $2,000 uh, to help you get through this difficult time if you find yourself still without employment. But on that that note, I'll pass things over to my colleague, Andrew Nichols. Rosie, thank you. This is CBC News Network, and as, as Rosie mentioned, the Prime Minister has announced an, uh, an eight-week extension to the emergency response benefit. We'll have the details and the reaction to that. And we will take you to Ottawa for a live event. In half an hour, the Department of National Defence and the Armed Forces will hold a briefing about Canada's fleet of cyclone helicopters. They were